my goal here tonight is to speak about impossible things and to make those impossible things possible. The way I would like to do that is basically it's very simple. I want to give you a way of making some sense of these things that can make these things more plausible. I'm going to do this from the perspective of my own profession. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a professor of comparative religion, and I study something called mystical literature. Mystical, the word mystical, of course, is a heavily abused word in contemporary English. Most of the words I wor work with actually are heavily abused, so get, get used to it. Um, it has a noble history, though. It goes back to ancient Greece, and it means literally the secret or the hidden. So these essentially are texts about some secret teaching, secret doctrine, or hidden structure of, rea hidden structure of reality. A mystical experience is quite simply an experience that claims to have some access to that which is hidden. Now, the structure of these kinds of experiences are paradoxical to our normal ways of perceiving and being in the world. In that normal way of being in the world, uh, which is now, uh, me looking at you, you looking at me, we think of ourselves as a subject, as a mental entity looking out into the objective world. And so we essentially have two dimensions, a mental dimension and a material dimension, and we imagine that those are mediated by the senses, which we shut down at the number five. This structure, this, this two, two, two material and mental dimension structure creates a kind of either-or logic of our ordinary everyday experience. Something is either mental or material. This is also the basis of modern reason and modern science, and it works extremely well. But not always. There are moments in individuals' lives where this binary, this dualism between the mind and the material world collapse or break down. Um, what essentially happens is that the mental dimension and the material dimension begin to resonate or correspond to one another in very dramatic and very detailed ways. Not necessarily as, one, as if one causes the other, but as if they've split off some deeper ground or super reality. The reason then they, that they might actually correspond or resonate is that they are actually the same thing on some deeper level. These experiences, which are rare, but which are very, very meaningful to the people who have them, uh, uh, historically have been referred to in religious terms. This is the miraculous. This is the magical. Today, in our more secular culture, people use another heavily abused word, the paranormal. Now, the paranormal, like the mystical, has a very noble and very philosophical history, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. Before I do that, I want to explain to you what I mean when I use this word. I mean three things. First, I mean an event that is, that is also an experience. In other words, I mean something that is subjective and objective at the same time. If you're just having a great interior experience, it's not paranormal. If you're just seeing something fantastic in the environment, but it doesn't correspond to your internal state, it's not paranormal. Both things have to be there. Secondly, I mean an event or experience that is marked by paradox, coincidence, and this logic of the both and. The material and the mental coincide. Again, they're, they're, they're pointing back to some common source. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I mean an experience or event that is mediated not just by the five senses, but by the sixth sense, the super sense of the human imagination in very uh, uh, extraordinary circumstances, as we'll see. Now, the word itself goes back to the 1880s and 1890s uh, around Cambridge University and Harvard University, uh, but it really doesn't come into, uh, into real use until around 1900 among French scientists who were studying a very specific category of this kind of phenomena, the poltergeist. 
the angry ghost. Um, what they were in fact studying was mostly young people. Poltergeist phenomena normally spike around pubescent boys and girls, often in highly conflicted family networks. So we think they have something to do with emotional and sexual conflict. And normally what happens in poltergeist phenomena is things break or fall or sometimes even catch on fire, but in highly symbolic ways. Uh, it's as if the emotional state of the young person or the conflicted person is exteriorizing itself in the environment, but still speaking in code, speaking in symbol. Um, so these researchers, they didn't think that these were ghosts, and that's the key here. They weren't adopting the older religious language. They were adopting this new language of the paranormal. So what the poltergeist really was, in their view, was not an angry ghost, but the ghost of anger. It was this human energy that could somehow exteriorize itself in the environment. Now, there are two things that follow from this idea or from this piece of speculation. The first is that the paranormal as a word, as it was conceived and coined by these scientists, is not the supernatural. It's not the religious. It's the supernatural. It's an entirely normal process that is beyond, para, our present model of the world. So they were moving out of the religious register into what they hoped would be a scientific register. Secondly, and I think more problematically for the scientific project, is that the paranormal is a kind of story. It's a kind of communication. It works with symbols and metaphors. Hence, the, the angry adolescent or the sexually conflicted adolescent doesn't produce lovely kittens and puppy dogs. Um, things break and explode. So there's a kind of symbolic nature to this, um, these, these phenomena. If you would allow me to be a little bit flippant, we could say that myth happens. Uh, myth, of course, is another heavily abused Greek word. I told you I only work in heavily abused words. Um, it means simply story, but it's come down to us as a kind of impossible story. And paranormal events often take on mythical qualities. They, they're very, they can be highly visual. They can be psychedelic. They can involve various forms of beings and deities. So, so myth, myth happens. If the paranormal is fundamentally about narrative and story and symbol and sign, one might expect that professional writers and artists would have some special access to these sorts of experiences, and one would be correct. I spent the last five, six, seven years um, having the pleasure of interviewing, hanging out with, and reading uh, a group of very gifted artists and authors who create popular culture, uh, mostly graphic novels and comic books. This is my midlife regression uh, project. Um, <laughs> And what I've found so extraordinary about it is that the most gifted artists and writers are precisely the ones who have had these sorts of experiences, which they themselves identify as the secret of their literary or artistic creativity. Okay? So this is what I'm most interested in, is this artistic or literary quality to, to these events. Let me just tell you one case, one story, Mark Twain. Twain, of course, was a great American writer and a humorist, and one of the many things he may have said and may or may not uh, is that history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And what he meant by that was that a human life is not simply linear and logical and temporal. It, it doesn't just move in a straight line. It tends to organize itself around clusters of meaning and coincidences and symbols and story. Twain was speaking or writing out of deep personal experience here. In the summer of 1858, Samuel Clemens and his brother Henry were working on the riverboat Pennsylvania. The night before they were to embark, Sam had a dream of Henry spread out laying in a metal casket with a borrowed suit and a bouquet of white roses with a single red rose in the center. 
He woke up, obviously distressed, took a walk outside to try to shake this dream off and convince himself that it was just a dream. Alas, it was not just a dream. The next day, Sam and Henry were separated through an argument with the riverboat captain, actually. And a few days later, Henry was killed on the riverboat Pennsylvania uh, in a boiler explosion. Uh, Sam uh, uh, got to the dead room in Memphis a few days later for the funeral. And there was Henry uh, in a borrowed suit in a metal casket, uh, just as his dream had predicted. And as he sat there and mourned and pondered his dream and this event, a woman walked in with a bouquet of white roses with a single red one in the middle and laid it on Henry's chest. Okay. So who of us in this room, if that were our brother and our dream, could seriously dismiss such a series of events? Twain could not. He spent much of the rest of his life trying to figure these things out. There were all too many of them in his life. He eventually tried to publish uh, an essay on them, on his own experiences. He wisely tried to publish it anonymously, but nobody would take an anonymous essay from Mark Twain. That seems like a stupid thing to do. Um, so he finally agreed to publish it under his own name, and it appeared in two installments in Harper's Magazine in 1891 and 1895. Both essays are, have the phrase mental telegraphy in the title. This was Twain's way of trying to capture this core conviction of his, which is my core message to you this evening, that these events have something to do with human communication, with symbolic behavior, with, with writing and reading. They're special types of writing and reading. The metaphor of the telegraph, of course, was the cutting edge technology of the time, and it didn't quite work, right? It's a failed metaphor. Twain, Twain's dream, after all, had not only transcended the limitations of space, like a telegraph message can, it had also transcended the parameters of time. Somehow Twain had flipped the pages forward a few days or weeks, and he had read a page uh, already written in the future. Now, it's at this point in the talk in which I could spend the next two hours uh, telling you hundreds of stories just like that. Uh, and they would come from people from all professions, all walks of life. They would come from great writers like Twain. They would come from world-class scientists like Wolfgang Pauli, the great quantum physicist around whom poltergeist phenomena spiked his, for his entire life. He was, by the way, extremely conflicted, both emotionally and, and probably sexually. Um, these stories would also involve uh, neuroscientists, doctors, nurses, psychotherapists who deal with people in traumatic or suffering contexts. Most of these stories, though, would be from ordinary people like you or me. Um, they would be from our mothers and fathers. They would be from our children. These events happen to all sorts of people in every culture, in every historical era for which we have a record. Today, people tend to employ popular culture to talk about them. Um, the phrases I've heard the most often are, it was as if I were a character in someone else's novel. It was as if I were caught in a science fiction movie, or it was as if it were all staged badly. It's, there's this, often this sort of humorous, trickster-like quality. What we would see, though, I think, if you look at these things very carefully and, and with an open mind, is that they reveal a paranormal that's not just a story, but it's a story waking up to its own authorship, to its own author, i.e. us. If you think about it, these sorts of phrases are actually quite true. We are all caught in a story. We are all caught in a novel that we may not even like. We are all born into cultures and languages and belief systems that may or may not serve us. 
And yet they define what we can think, what we can imagine, who we can become. We are, in fact, all written. We are all being played in some way. And so how, what, the way I think of these sorts of extraordinary experiences are there are moments in a life in which the curtain opens and we can see the, the, the human wizard pulling all the levers behind the curtain. There are moments of awakening. Once we adopt such a narrative approach to paranormal experiences, a lot of things suddenly make a lot of sense. For example, we can now understand why professional writers are so attracted to these states and write about them so openly. We can also understand why textual metaphors are so common in the history of psychical phenomena. So to this day, we speak of psychical readers and automatic writing. And Twain, of course, wrote about mental telegraphy. These are all about special types of writing and reading. We can also well understand and begin to appreciate why science, why professional science, had such a difficult time with these things. Now, I am not a scientist, but I know enough science to know I shouldn't be talking about science. <laughs> but I think what I've already told you about these events explains why they are so rare in the laboratory or in anything that's controlled. Most of the stories, most of the references are about human trauma. They're about suffering. They're about death. These things are hard to get in a controlled laboratory, an ethical one anyway. It's also hard to imagine how one can get a story into a calculus equation or a scientific theory. Science can be done with these things, though. I have a lot of dear colleagues who do wonderful science with exactly these kinds of experiences. But it's sort of like studying the stars in the middle of the day or in the late afternoon. You can see them. They're starting to come out. You can sort of detect them, but barely, right? They're all there. We know the stars are there all day long, but they're blinded out. They're outshined by our own star sun. But when the sun goes down, when the rational ego departs or sinks below consciousness in states like dream, in states like trauma, car accidents, heart surgeries, comas, the stars come out and we can see the true scope and measure of mind. Finally, this also helps us explain the ambiguity of these sorts of experiences. I think the relationship between fraud and fact or trick and truth in paranormal events is much more complicated than we realize. I'm reminded of the placebo effect in medical science. The placebo is essentially a fraud. It's a lie, and it works. It works really well. Somehow it tricks the mind into extraordinary capacities to deal with the human body. And paranormal events are a lot like this. Their visual quality, their mythical quality, somehow tricks the mind into extraordinary capacities that far, far extend outside the placebo effect. If I can change my analogy here to art, I think what we might say is what these events finally reveal is that consciousness isn't what we thought it was. Consciousness is somehow fundamental to reality. It's a painter. It's the canvas, and it's the paint all at once. I know that makes no sense. That's why it works here. <laughs> if we can start to think of these experiences with the tools of literature and art, my hope is, is that these sorts, of the things, these sorts of events can be treated with more curiosity, with more generosity, and they can become what I think they actually already are, real world invitations to become our own authors of the impossible. Thank you very much.